Welcome back to our second episode of Curious Conversations. My name is Shreya, and today we have with us Dr. Philip Cohen. Hi, Dr. Cohen. How are you doing today? Very good. Good afternoon. Yeah. So, Dr. Cohen, could you start by telling us a little bit about your background? Sure. I went to college at Franklin Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, followed by medical school at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. I subsequently completed a residency in dermatology at Columbia University in New York City. Subsequently, I did fellowships in dermatopathology and Mohs surgery. During the time since my residency, I've worked both full-time and part-time and both in the academic center and in private practice. Wow, that's awesome. So you have a very extensive background in dermatology and dermatopathology. So can you tell us about why you decided to pursue research in medical science? Sure. Um, I have enjoyed the opportunity to continuously make clinical observations based on the patients I've had the privilege of seeing and treating and the desire to share these observations with other clinicians and um, readers of the journals I've had the opportunity to publish in. In addition, the second reason would be is that I also very much enjoy mentoring both medical students and residents and fellows. And it gives me an opportunity to blend the observations with the teaching. That's absolutely fascinating. Now, before we go into your research, I have one more question for you. Why dermatology? Dermatology is a fascinating field. Mm -hmm. It allows you both to do medically based management and if you desire pathology and if you desire surgery. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to correlate what you see clinically easily with what is happening in the skin through taking skin biopsies and then putting the clinical image that you observe together with the pathology image that is found after evaluating the tissue. Right, and the skin is our largest organ. And of course, it's arguably one of the most important organs that we have. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. And today we're going to be discussing one of the articles that you published recently in Curious, in which you reported for the first time a new type of tumor lysis syndrome. Could you tell us about the case that you reported in that article? Yes, be a pleasure. Let me take one step back. Mm -hmm. Tumor lysis syndrome is a condition that occurs in oncology patients. It basically has been associated with systemic malignancies, either hematologic lymphomas and leukemias, and also solid tumors there is such a rapid destruction of the cancer that the cells release their contents. There's high potassium, there's high phosphorus, there's high uric acid, and the patients can develop kidney problems, cardiac arrhythmias, or seizures. And that's the traditional tumor lysis syndrome. Again, an observation based on a patient I had the, the privilege of managing or co-managing with the oncologist prompted the change in paradigm and the suggestion of a new class of tumor lysis syndrome, basically cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome. And thereby the previous tumor lysis syndrome would be referred to as systemic tumor lysis syndrome. The patient was a 70 year old man and he had a tumor of the salivary duct. He had been, he had received chemotherapy, and then chemotherapy with radiation, and his tumor rapidly not only recurred, but metastasized to his skin. His skin metastases were extensive. They went from his neck to below his umbilicus and across his entire chest. It had a hemorrhagic appearance to it, which has been phrased carcinoma hemorrhagic toides, and it appeared clinically almost like a knight's shield. And so the description which we use was almost the shield sign because it went across his entire chest. Mm -hmm. 
He was then treated with two agents. One is bevacizumab, which is a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor, and temsirlimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor. Within days of the first treatment, he developed ulcerations on his chest in the areas where the cutaneous metastases had occurred. In addition, the other areas of metastases on his skin seemed to melt away and his lymph nodes, which had been markedly swollen, also diminished significantly in size. The appearance of this ulceration is what we termed tum cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that you can correlate what you see clinically with the pathology. He had, his cutaneous metastases had been biopsied, and what we had observed was the tumor completely filled the entire dermis. The skin consists of epidermis, which is a thin layer on top, a thicker layer of dermis, and then subcutaneous fat below. This gentleman's tumor completely filled the dermis. With this initial single treatment, we hypothesized that all of the tumor was completely wiped out. So all that you had left is a thin layer of epidermis on top, fat on the bottom, and nothing in between. The dermis was gone. Therefore, there was no blood supply to the epidermis, and it ulcerated, it necrosed, and then ulcerated. So you can correlate what we saw clinically with the pathology we observed prior to his treatment. Wow, that's an absolutely fascinating case report, Dr. Cohen. And thank you so much for sharing that. So I have a few questions about tumor lysis syndrome in general. Are there any demographics that are particularly affected by the syndrome and who's most at risk for it? Like both cutaneous and systematically speaking. I don't think there are specific demographics as far as particular patient populations. The systemic and is predominantly seen in patients with rapid proliferating tumors or tumors that are very susceptible to treatment. In many cases, the oncologists are aware of the potential side effect. And when they treat them with therapy, they also prophylax so this will not occur. However, there's a subset of patients who develop tumor lysis syndrome spontaneously, and therefore it's still seen in both solid tumors and hematologic tumors. Mm -hmm. In patients with cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome, scouring through the literature, I and my co-authors were able to find individual cases and studies with patients with both either spontaneous or therapy-induced cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome. Perhaps the most interesting group were women with breast cancer who were treated with the bevacizumab, the vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. And in these women, their primary cancer or metastases developed ulcerations. Again, it may be secondary to the drug eliminating the blood supply to the tumor and that result occurring. However, in our patient with the salivary duct tumor, there have been no previous reports of the growth factor in and of itself having anti-tumor activity. And so we favored it being the temsirolimus or the growth factor affecting the blood supply or both. Okay, that's absolutely fascinating. Now a question for you, and you actually kind of led into this. Were there any similarities between the case reported in the paper and the reports that you mentioned in your paper of idiopathic solid tumors? And just as like a review, idiopathic means without a known cause, correct? That is correct. We introduced the word idiopathic. The literature previously has referred to these as spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome. So both are correct and perhaps historically spontaneous should remain, although the patients with spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome, both systemic or idiopathic, are associated with rapidly growing tumors which have progressed so significantly that they've outgrown their blood supply and then began to necrose. Okay. So what puts a patient at higher risk for tumor lysis syndrome? For both, again, it's, again, the same issues. It's more common with hematologic malignancies than solid tumors. 
more common with rapidly growing lymphomas such as Burkett's lymphoma or acute myelogenous leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia, tumors which show rapid proliferation, extensive growth in the patient, or for the idiopathic, those are the factors. With therapy, it's then the tumors which are more highly responsive to therapy. And so you get a dramatic response initially with a huge amount of the tumor burden being destroyed with the initial therapy. So now that we've talked about the phenomenon of tumor lysis syndrome, I want to ask you, what happens to the patients most commonly after the tumor lysis has taken place? In the patients with the skin or cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome, there's been necrosis mm -hmm. and normal wound healing thereafter. Mm -hmm. Some of these patients have had very, well, the breast cancers had a very progressive disease and did not survive secondary to other tumor related issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, again, there are probably more cases of cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome than are presented in the literature. And many of them or none of them are listed or cited with that name or nomenclature because it hasn't been presented in that manner. Mm -hmm. We also, my co-authors and I think that with the advent of targeted therapy with precision oncology, where the oncologists are much better able to target or find therapies that will specifically treat the genomic abnormality of the tumor in patients with cutaneous metastases, we anticipate that there should be a higher incidence of cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome. And we sort of look for future reports to come out and support this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I loved when I was reading your paper is the thoroughness of the new classification of cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome. So now that you've designated cutaneous tumor lysis syndrome as like a subset of this well-known phenomenon, do you hope that this will, or what do you hope will happen? I anticipate, or I hope that it will be recognized for what it is. I think that there, in dermatology now, there is a subset of individuals who refer to themselves as oncodermatologists. And they basically are managing patients in cancer center affiliated dermatology clinics. I anticipate that they will see more of these patients as the patients continue to be treated with targeted therapies and there is a more dramatic tumor response to these therapies. Hopefully these individuals will be prompted to share the observations so that this will become more acknowledged amongst the dermatology community and the oncology community. Yes, well, thank you so much for shedding a light on this new classification of tumor lysis syndrome. And like you said, I also anticipate that many of these dermatologists will start to recognize this new subset of the syndrome. So now we wanted to ask you a few more personal questions. As you yourself are a very established researcher, we wanted to know if you could have like any advice for people who were beginning in their research careers. So starting out, what skills would you say are essential for a career in research? I think being open to new observations, to not dismissing what you see because it doesn't fit into the standard scenario of what you expect, but to sort of observing and then remembering and then perhaps either presenting in a meeting or writing or both to share these new findings. Awesome. And what has been the most rewarding part of your career so far? I enjoy taking care of patients and helping them with their skin problems. I also tremendously enjoy mentoring um, students and residents. And I've been able to combine both. I tend to have the opportunity to observe many things which I think are interesting and am able to encourage the people who I work with to put these observations together 
in a written form and then share them with the medical community. Mm -hmm. That sounds very nice. And finally, what was your favorite paper that you've written so far? I've written almost a thousand papers. Wow. Uh, and it's, that's, that's a very difficult question. I'll say perhaps one of the more unique papers that I've written also published in Curious is related is an autobiographic case report regarding the swelling of my hands mm -hmm. after running half marathons or marathons. And the it's referred to as I've coined an acronym POTASH, which stands for post um, ambulatory swollen. There had been one paper 10 years ago published in Brazil with this observation. Again, it's something which is much more common than is obviously published. The hiking community and some of the available magazines on walking or running have carried articles on this topic, but the medical literature has not seemed to have found additional papers on this. And so the it's one of the papers which, again, I have a personal interest in because I would notice my hands were twice their size after completing 13 miles. And uh, it wasn't hives and it's not urticaria. The mechanism of pathogenesis has not been figured out and it resolves spontaneously in two to six hours. But it is probably, you asked, what is the most favorite paper? It's a unique paper because I directly relate to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, thank you so much for all of your contributions to research. As a budding researcher myself, it's I'm immensely inspired by you and your contributions to dermatology. So thank you so much for joining us today on Curious Conversations. It's been a pleasure to have you. Again, thank you for having me.